welcome to the first episode of Let's Get Kids Smart. I'm here today with Corey Lockhardy from The Tiny Activist. Corey is a former classroom teacher who's passionate about encouraging anti-racist, anti-bias education and highlighting the importance of diversity and inclusion in popular children's books and in the classroom. And they're also a partner here at KidSmart. So thank you so much for being my first guest, Tori. Oh my gosh, I didn't know I was the first. Now yeah. I feel even fancier. <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so can you tell me a little bit about your past and like how it brought you to creating The Tiny Activist? Yeah, for sure. So um, I... <laughs> like many people, have had many career paths in life. Uh, and so in 2016, about, oh, after being in the restaurant industry for about nine years, uh, I decided to go back to school for education. Um, and I got my bachelor's in early education uh, and in inclusive settings specifically uh, with an early childhood focus. And then I went to grad school for gender and cultural studies. Uh, all this was in Boston and I was a classroom teacher for a few years. And then one thing led to another. Uh, I ended up leaving the classroom and now I do a lot of my work focuses around, um, not only literacy, but finding really amazing books, uh, for any situation that arrives, uh, arises. Cause it's hard to be a tiny human, you know? It's really hard to be a tiny human in the world, especially if you have any myriad of historically marginalized or oppressed identities. Uh, and so now I do some consulting, uh, professional development, and stuff like that. If you need any books, I'm here. Nice. <laughs> and can you tell me a little bit about why representation in books is so important for young kids? Yeah, absolutely. So basically, even if we think about anything at all, um, in this case, specifically, we're talking about books, but everybody needs to see their lived experiences validated externally, you know, especially in the media. And when we consume media, especially during childhood, we learn what our society values, we learn what our culture values. When we're only taught about hardship, uh, oppression, traumatic experiences about a specific group, uh, for example, black people, this turns someone into a lesson for others. It turns their generational trauma, it turns their lived experiences into something to be consumed by others and intellectualized. Um, and so this also sort of suggests that somebody is able to be a spokesperson for an identity or a cultural group. And it also unfairly puts the emotional labor on this historically marginalized person to educate others, which then only further causes harm and uh, can lead to re-traumatizing. It can lead to being emotionally burnt out, you know, that's not a very welcoming environment if you have to defend your humanity in any way just to be seen as a valid person. So uh, because this is so dehumanizing and it often causes, especially in books and media, for people to have to sacrifice um, examples of cultural pride in order to defend their identity in the media. So speaking of a community that I'm a part of, uh, the LGBTQIA2S plus community, the, uh, the alphabet mafia, we're getting bigger every day. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so many of the initial children's books featuring same sex couples, um, which has really only been for a few decades, uh, since the eighties and nineties. And, so many of these books are focused on overcoming identity-based oppression, convincing heterosexual families uh, that same-sex family structures are valid. And But now, sort of, that our community is a little bit more, you know, overall, much more accepted socially, um, we can sort of see some of the books that are coming out now uh, that can be 
examples of more unapologetic queer characters and books that focus on joyful representation rather than just fighting to be seen or fighting to be seen as human. Yeah, 100%. That kind of made me think there of like when you see um, like rom-com movies that are about like queer people now, it's always about like them coming out or it's always about like it, they're never just there and existing. There's always mm-hmm. like some kind of like, I don't know, like something more behind it. Like, can we, can we just be? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, stories don't have to have a coming out narrative. And people, I mean, people don't even have to come out to be valid, obviously. But it's really beautiful and refreshing to sort of drop into a story where none of these things like coming out and if we want to go like, quote unquote, finding yourself, you know, yeah. that has to precede the actual exciting events in the movie. Yeah, hundred percent. It doesn't have to be the main theme. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I know that some people kind of like avoid talking to kids about like certain subjects because they're afraid of mistakes or getting things wrong, or they think that kids are too young to learn about specific topics like LGBTQ families or gender identity are like afraid of making mistakes when they talk to kids about race. How can people kind of gain more confidence around that? And how can we teach kids about specific topics in an age appropriate manner? Yeah, for sure. This is probably by far the biggest question that I get from people. And I really want to start out by validating that it's really natural to feel nervous Uh, especially teaching and talking to somebody about a topic that is new to you personally. Um, You know, I always use the example of like, if I was a substitute teacher and somebody was like, here you go, here's your AP calculus class notes for the day that you're going to (laughs) teach. I I would be a disaster. (laughs) I would be just like so sweaty. I would be so nervous. Uh, Me too. (laughs) My math levels just aren't there. So like, I would feel really uncomfortable trying to teach somebody that. And it's the exact same thing, you know, like, nobody is particularly prepared to have to explain racism to a kid, you know, and nobody wants to have to do it. But the fact of the matter is that we are in a white supremacy culture. And that culture has created a shield that protects white people from not only sort of the inner workings of this cultural oppression, um, but also it doesn't prepare any of us for talking about this, especially, um, you know, I'm in my 30s. I come from the generation that people are like, don't talk about race, colorblind, everybody's happy and fine. Mm -hmm. And that's invalidating. It's also not very helpful. So I think recognizing that you're going to be uncomfortable, that's the first step, you know, even this is what I have focused on since 2016. And it's like still not easy, you know, (laughs) it's like never fun to talk about all of these things. And also any sort of social justice education topic it starts with the same foundation, no matter what age. I personally am a proponent of teaching this right from the beginning with the foundation, because then I feel like there is going to be less unlearning that has to be Mm -hmm. done later on in life and later on in schooling. So if we start from a social justice foundation, any person needs to cultivate a personal identity that's centered around joy and empowerment. And they also need to be able to recognize that in others, especially when their lived experiences are different. So I think that's a really great place to start is talking about this identity cultivation. And then also a second piece to add on to that, which will help facilitate these conversations, would be recognizing justice and A developmentally appropriate way that I always explain this uh, when I was in the classroom, I worked with three to five year olds. And so anybody that has been around probably even one three to five year old has always heard something along the lines of like, 
that's not fair. This isn't fair. Mm-hmm. This game's not fair. And so, okay, let's take that, this statement. Kids are learning at this age about fair and unfair. And we can take this a step further and not, and sort of leave that surface level fairness and unfairness conversation behind and really get to the center of the issue of, is it really unfair or is it just not the outcome that you wanted? You know, (laughs) like, is it really unfair that somebody else won the four square game or (laughs) did you just want to win? Because like, I get it, you know? We got to be the four square champion, but (laughs) just because somebody else won doesn't necessarily mean that that was unfair. It just means that you're disappointed. Mm -hmm. So being able to draw this like very specific through line to a situation, to this big abstract concept of justice can be taught and explained in the classroom using familiar terms and situations. And it really helps, especially with these big abstract topics. Uh, Kids that are three to five are just sort of conceptualizing that the world operates in like a not entirely egocentric way. Mm -hmm. And they're also just being able to conceptualize abstract things and algebraic thinking. So being able to point to a specific, uh, phrase or situation really also helps to kind of explain um, and helps with fostering, you know, kids naturally are inclined for empathy, fairness, and we can take these natural inclinations and help develop critical thinking skills and recognition of injustice due to marginalized aspects of one identity. You know, we can talk about visible and invisible identities. Uh, We can go deeper with discussions of justice and fairness. And that brings in topics like identifying stereotypes and signs to look for. And we can then take it to is, ooh. Too excited. Uh, (laughs) Is somebody being unfairly having a rule applied to them? You know, if we want to talk again about the the classroom thing, Mm -hmm. you know, are all the rules applied fairly to all the students in the classroom? Or is there maybe one rule that's like, oh, girls aren't allowed to go play in the mud or something, Mm -hmm. you know, then you can sort of, again, have that very concrete example to a large abstract sort of thing. So I hope that helps. And I hope that (laughs) that makes people feel a little bit better that, you know, just got to keep having ongoing conversations. Like when we learn English or when we learn, you know, history, we don't just have one conversation about grammar. We learn all the different parts of grammar. We have ongoing things. We you know, do things like spelling tests where things get progressively more complex. So like, why would any of these topics like anti-bias, anti-racist topics, uh, talking about gender stereotypes, all of these things, we're certainly not going to be having one conversation about it. So it's making the time to embed all of these within regular parts of the day. Yeah, that's a really great point. And yeah, I think it must have a huge impact on kids when you start with an anti-bias, anti-racist um, curriculum in school, as opposed to like trying to unlearn specific things later in life. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So diversity and inclusion play a huge role in our kids programs, but we know, you know, that like we can always grow and do better. Uh, what do you recommend when it comes to creating diverse characters in kids books? For sure. Well, So I really like this question because it sort of lets you, the universal you, get really macro and micro with it because I think once we reach a place where the people creating the media is representative to what our society actually looks like, then I think we'll be on a really solid path because 
right now, it's just so un incredibly unbalanced, and there's extremely poor representation of many lived experiences of racialized and historically marginalized and oppressed individuals. And we also see people of the dominant culture, which is white Eurocentrism, us, we're, we're in North America, so mm -hmm. I can only speak to that, but so we're talking about our specific white Eurocentric culture. They, they are creating the narratives for other people, and this is typically through their own lens. So this would be talking about Christopher Columbus discovering America versus mm -hmm. talking about colonialism and or at least having primary sources that you study and talk about from each side, you know, because some folks might be like, yes, America was founded when Christopher Columbus rolled up in here on his ship and it was great. It was yeah. just a beautiful land of milk and honey, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then if you look into it, you're like, oh, the indigenous and first nations people who have not only been living here for thousands of years, but they mm -hmm. also, they consider 1492 their apocalypse, you know, like, Indigenous folks are living in a post-apocalyptic society, according to them, because of mm -hmm. colonization. And it's very unfair to not have all of these narratives represented. And this is super disingenuous to assume that everybody has the same outlook on mm -hmm. history, on... Uh, what feels good for them to like see people uh, that look like them and that think like them and feel like them on TV and then to feel like it's not accurately represented. Um, so we also can sort of, it's disingenuous to the groups that are being represented. It's also indicative of this larger white savior complex by people speaking over others instead of amplifying their voices. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend, I guess, uh, reflecting on the stories that you want to be told and then thinking about who is the authority to tell them. And if you're not that person, that's totally fine. Pass the mic and, you know, allow others to create their own narratives and, if this is in terms of illustrations, you know, don't fall into tropes. Don't try to, uh, and whew, sorry, I got all, got all That's emotional. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if you're also talking in terms of illustrations, then you really want to make sure that you're not falling into tropes and also if you're ever in a room where any sort of decisions are being made, whatever priority level could be about where you want to order lunch, or it could be about, I don't know, a $10 million funding deal, but it's our decision or sorry, don't know why I said decision. I meant responsibility. <laughs> uh, it's absolutely our responsibility to advocate for more diverse voices in the room. And diversity, I have a love-hate relationship with the word diversity, okay. uh, because I think some people sort of misapply it, um, especially when it comes to books. People are calling, like, if you have a picture book, even if it's a beautiful, fabulous picture book that you love, there are books that I love that fall under this category. But if they are, if this book is being made by two creators that are white, and even if the illustrations are people of color, I wouldn't consider that, consider that a diverse book, you know, because both of the creators are white. And I'm so glad that they're choosing to illustrate a family of color or a protagonist of color something like that, an underrepresented voice, but also why, <laughs> like, 
why why are we choosing the white illustrators to to write these stories and i'm not saying that white illustrators should be relegated to only making white characters uh that's not right (laughs) and that's that's not what i'm saying but why again like why aren't we asking you know a haitian illustrator to come in and illustrate the book you know um it's not diversity if it's still white people doing it if it's still all white people it doesn't really matter what's happening because that's just even though the group of white people may be diverse in you know cultural background socioeconomic status geographical location political views it's still not as diverse as it could be so i think just trying to remember the privileges that you have and making sure that you're always trying to advocate and include others whenever possible with whatever decisions remember that very long sandwich i mentioned a long time ago you know like yeah why not invite everybody you want everybody's opinion whether or not you're getting lunch or doing Mm -hmm. that 10 million dollar deal hope that made sense no that makes complete (laughs) sense and i'm i'm so glad you brought that up because it's really important to reflect on these things and like you might be trying to be diverse but like in the background are you actually diverse you actually like putting your money where your mouth is kind of thing exactly yeah i get it really important yeah So you curate book lists for kids as well. So what do you look for when you're curating and recommending these book lists? And then what kind of themes do you like to highlight? I think I have a good idea, but I'll let you, <laughs> I'll let you go into it a little bit more. <laughs> for sure. So when I am creating a book list or even just when I'm sort of looking at books, um, I look for books that not only embody like the very specific theme that I'm gathering resources for, Um, For example, I'm doing one about stories that feature um, individuals with parents that are incarcerated or reentering society, Mm -hmm. you know, which is like a very underrepresented segment of the world of the experience. You know, there's only a handful of the books. And so when I'm looking for these resources, who are the creators? Are they the stakeholders in these experiences? Are they formerly incarcerated? Have they had a parent who's formerly incarcerated? Um, You know, sort of what is their relationship to Mm. the situation that's being discussed in the book? And because that creates a more authentic narrative And it also increases the diversity of the voices being published, you know, like just what we were talking about. If two people write a really meaningful book about a parent and a child being reunited after they were incarcerated, that's amazing. And I hope it's beautiful and meaningful, but it's going to be more meaningful if the people that are creating these books are maybe abolitionists. So we Mm -hmm. can add a spin on that to the story. If the people have, um, you know, if they have more experience and they understand the system versus somebody else coming in being like, oh, that would just be a lovely story to write about. Yes. And not really having any personal emotions invested in it besides, oh, wow, that would be a great story to write. You know, I think a lot of the time you can tell when someone's doing Mm -hmm. that as well. It kind of comes off a little bit like yeah not as genuine yeah yeah for sure so um i also really want to make sure that the stories uh side characters are accurate accurately represented and nothing reinforces negative stereotypes uh white supremacy culture you know i think people can think about how disability is represented in picture books and like I am a non-disabled person, um, but so I can't speak too much on the matter. But if you think about all the books that you look through, if there is a disabled character, it's like probably a white child in a wheelchair and there's Mm. probably going to be a desire to dance. Like (laughs) there are so many books that fall into this trope of like a wheelchair user who then 
needs to do something that's not typically associated with uh, whatever disability mm. it is. Um, so that's, you know, what I'm looking for. Even the side characters um, is really important because if you think about if you're reading a book to kids versus if the kids are reading the book themselves, then the language is also super important. Um, you know, some classrooms don't use words like stupid or hate. Mm -hmm. And so if you have preliterate kids, then you can sort of not say that, you know, when mm -hmm. you're like doing the read aloud thing. Yeah. Um, which like all teachers have really sick guns from like holding up the books <laughs> to the side. Uh, <laughs> but so you can sort of get away with that. But when the students are able to read the books themselves, they're going to notice these things. And all of the students are going to be able to notice the illustrations. They're going to notice something, especially if somebody is stereotypically represented, you know, mm -hmm. so and huh, topics near and dear <laughs> to my heart. Uh, <laughs> well, that's why we have you here. <laughs> we want to know all about it. And yeah, it seems like you put a lot of thought and effort into these into these book lists. So I'm really glad that there's someone out there doing this. It's definitely <sighs> necessary. I am. I am but one small, angry feminist cog in the machine. <laughs> uh, but I am sure trying. I love so. this. <laughs> yeah. So what are you reading at the moment? And what's your all time favorite book? <sighs> I have also asked these questions before and mm -hmm. everyone is like, how could you ask me my favorite book? And I'm like, it's not that hard. <laughs> and then you, oh, the turns have tabled. My own medicine <laughs> does not taste good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I had to make the decision myself. So I actually grabbed them. I was like, I'm okay. so prepared. Uh, so the first book I am reading is called Empire's Nursery. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely fabulous. Um, and so it's basically about how Kidlet was designed to promote American imperialism and the belief in like this very America freedom, like Eagle Screech yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> empire that we see in a lot of far right conservative groups mm -hmm. that is uh, disguised as patriotism. And it's excellent. Nice. Uh, <laughs> you know, just like really light and fluffy. Oh, yeah. It's I've been nothing. reading lots of the light and fluffy books <laughs> the last month or so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, like a beach read. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I would have to say I was able to narrow it down to like probably top five. So okay, Amazon's Abolitionists and Activists is mm -hmm. like a YA graphic novel. Ooh. It's all about feminism and it's specifically about like black feminism and feminists of color and how they have done a lot of the heavy lifting throughout mm -hmm. society and one of my absolute favorite illustrations don't know if you can see or hear me let me move so, my, my outside. oh i love that yeah it's so for folks who can't see uh or need an image image assistance because it is pretty small so it's like a fight scene of a bunch of different mutants of sort of you know, they say things like uh, online harassment, poverty, racism, things like that. And it's all women of color that are fighting all of these monsters. And then floating on the clouds up above are all of the white women and the white feminists. And it's a powerful Kendall, image. Kendall, yeah, like shoot me through the heart. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> so well done. Absolutely fabulous. Nice. And... You know, it goes hard and it talks a lot about the history that is very whitewashed mm -hmm. it is in the education that I received in various U.S. states. So, yes, highly recommend both of those. Nice. Yeah. 
Um, so we're coming up to the end of the interview now. Unfortunately, <laughs> I could stay here talking all day. Yeah, let's hang. Um, but I'm sure there are people out there who want to learn more about you. So can you tell the listeners where they can find you? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a website that is thetinyactivist.com. You can find me on Instagram at the tiny activists. It's plural. Uh, <laughs> Noted. <laughs> yes. Uh, the website, not plural. Instagram, plural. Uh, I have a podcast called the Picture Books to Gang podcast where a couple of my besties and I, we talk about picture books. We talk about tropes that you see in picture books. Uh, we make a lot of weird jokes. And <laughs> I also do stuff like... I have social justice curriculum, uh, curated book boxes to go along with the curriculum, uh, lesson plans, discussion guides, all sorts of stuff uh, on the website that you can check out, as well as the consulting and professional development stuff I do. If you want me to come and yell about feminism and racism at, to you personally, I would be <laughs> happy to. Uh, and we also have a bookshop in case you're looking for... Uh, you know, library lists or something like that to that are sort of broken down into different categories if you're looking for stuff. And shoot me an email, shoot me a DM. I'm here. I'm always ready to chat and be salty about the patriarchy. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, again, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Um, I found this conversation to be very insightful. I think that people are going to learn a lot. And I'm really glad that we could have this conversation. Thank you so much. I'm so glad, too. It was great chatting. Even though you didn't chat very much, it was like me on a soapbox. But I'm a good listener. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. You had a lot of great things to say. So I was like, ears <laughs> wide open. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs>